Hi there, welcome to part three. In this video, we are going to apply some of those important muscle physiology concepts to some specific muscles of the trunk. Specifically, we need to know that the origin is the fixed point, the less movable attachment site. The insertion is the more movable attachment site. And so the when sarcomeres shorten, the insertion moves toward the origin. And so that's the first really important piece of information, just a review from the last video. The second really important information is that in order to produce opposite actions, muscles attach to opposite sides of the joint. And so in this next installment, we are going to see that muscles that attach to the back of the spine help us to stand up. Muscles that attach to the front of our torso are going to help us bend over, flex our spine. So let's take a look at some of the muscles. Okay. Um, let's first learn about a pair of antagonist muscles, right? the ones that help us to stand up straight, extend our spine versus flex our spine. Okay. First group are the erector spinae. Uh, as I said in the last video, muscles are named according to where they are, what they do, what they look like, etc. In this name, we see erector. Right? It helps us to erect our spine, to stand up straight. And of course, what is it erecting? It's erecting the spine. Right? And this is Latin just meaning like of the, right? Erector of the spine. Okay, These muscles are on the posterior side of our spine. Okay, um, So they are essentially pulling on the vertebrae, and they're pulling them backwards. Okay, The origin of this group of muscles is on the sacrum, so way down here. So on the iliac crest, which is essentially our hips, and on many of the lumbar vertebrae, right? So remember that origins, um, if they are on the torso, um, or if both origin and insertion is on the torso, the one that is closer to the hips is going to be the more fixed point, okay? The hips are much more stable, right? Much harder to move up to the insertion, specifically the thoracic vertebrae, right? so way up here, right? thoracic vertebrae, um, and the ribs. Okay? So these erector spinae, right? multiple types of, or multiple individual muscles, but collectively called erector spinae. Here's the origin, here's the insertion, and so when these muscles shorten, here is pulled back to here. Okay? So the action is to erect the spine. Okay, um, so extension, right, for erector spinning. On the other side of the spine, right, we don't have, um, or these muscles essentially are attached to the rib cage, which is of course attached to the spine. If you move the ribs, you move the spine. This muscle is called the rectus abdominis, or your six-pack muscle. The origin is on the pubic symphysis, right? So essentially right on your pubic bone, um, part of your hips, okay? Less movable site. Um, way down here. Um, the insertion is on the sternum and the costal cartilages of ribs five through seven. And so when this insertion is pulled towards the origin, we get flexion of the spine, okay? So for both of these muscles, we can see that the more stable point is essentially on the hips. The less stable point is on um, the spine or something attached to the spine, and they because they are on opposite sides of the torso, one produces flexion and the other produces extension. Okay, so opposite antagonist muscles. Um, this image here is very similar to a model that we have in the lab. Here is the spine, so dorsal side. Here is the ventral side, the belly side, and so the erector spinae are on the posterior side of the vertebrae. Rectus abdominis, of course, is on the anterior side, um, you know, not attaching to the spine itself, but attaching to the ribs, which, of course, can then move the spine. And so these are antagonist muscles. All right, let's take a look at them from a slightly different perspective. Um, on the back of the spine, dorsal spine, um, we can see lots of different erector spinae. We don't need to know all of these individual names, right? Just collectively, they're the erector spinae. Um, and so they pull these attachment sites closer to this attachment site insertion towards origin, again, extending the spine. 
on the other side, we have the origin, cubic symphysis. We had the insertion way up here on the ribs and the sternum. And so when this is pulled towards this, you do a sit up. You bend down to touch your toes. Okay. Antagonist actions, antagonist muscles. Okay. Um, some muscles of the retaining wall. Okay. So both the erector spinae and the rectus abdominis are both just, you know, allowing us to stand up a bit down. Um, but we also have actually multiple layers of muscle tissue that create um, essentially a retaining wall to keep all of your guts in, right? To keep your viscera inside. Um, in this image, we can see that, um, you know, here is your rectus abdominis and we have multiple other layers forming the rest of this body wall, essentially. Okay? Um, contracting these muscles can change your abdominal cavity pressure, right? So it can increase the pressure um, to facilitate childbirth, to facilitate defecation. Um, it can block the flow of blood back up to your lungs if you're holding your breath really hard and you're contracting your stomach muscles because you're trying to do that one exercise, lift the one weight, um, and you know, oh, everything is so tense. Don't do that, stop, take a breath, right? Um, and allow blood to go back up to your lungs. Right? So changes in abdominal cavity pressure um, are produced by um, both your diaphragm, and we'll talk all about that next semester, and contracting these abdominal muscles. Um, these muscles also allow us to stabilize our torso, the axis of our body. Um, and so uh, if you are, well, so this is a good thing um, to build up these stabilizer muscles in order to uh, maybe take a little bit of pressure off of your spine and those squishy intervertebral discs. Um, and of course, just building your core gives you a lot more stability um, in general. Okay, um, some of these muscles uh, essentially form a route to the lower limb. And so I just wanna point out here that some of the muscles um, from the lumbar region actually extend all the way down to your femur. Um, and they help you to you know, lift your leg at the hip out in front of you. Okay, four layers. I have to look at all of them, but the externalmost one is the external oblique, right? So this one way out here on the outside. Um, the internal oblique is the middle layer, and then finally the transverse is abdominis. So one, two, three layers that we're going to look at um, in just a moment. Um, also, as part of this is another muscle called the quadratus lumborum, or the QL, literally mean like, meaning like the four of the lumbar. Okay, um, and one that we will discuss. Uh, in the third unit is the iliopsoas. Um, this again has been annexed for the leg, right? So it's a hip flexor instead of an abdominal wall muscle. Okay. So let's take a look. Um, I know that we've looked at this a little bit before, but for some review, here is the external oblique. Okay. We're not going to go through all of the individual origins and insertions and all the tiny little details, um, but you should be able to recognize um, where the muscle is and generally what it does. And of course, if I give you an origin and an insertion, you should be able to tell me that the, um, the action of the muscle is this, okay? Um, so the external oblique, um, the fibers run in this weird angle, thus, it is an oblique muscle and external, it is all the way on the outside of these essentially four layers. Okay? When insertion is pulled towards origin, right, the rib cage and thus the spine are pulled to the side. Okay, So um, we can see here, this is the posterior spine, um, the external oblique, um, the insertion will be up here, the origin will be down here. And so when insertion is pulled towards origin, it pulls the entire torso to the side. Right, so that would be called lateral flexion. External oblique is responsible for lateral flexion. Of course, there are two of them, right? One on the left side, one on the right side. And so if the left external oblique contracts, you go to the left. If the right external oblique contracts, you go to the right, okay? Um, if we peel off this layer, the external oblique, what we see deep to that um, are actually two different muscles. One is the rectus abdominis, right? So that is a spine flexor. Right, so spine flexion. This gets pulled down here. You bend over to tie your shoe. 
Um, but also we see the internal oblique. Note that the fibers are passing in opposite directions to the external oblique. So um, these essentially produce the same actions, but um, can strengthen that action by pulling um, you know, one in this way and one in that way. Okay. Um, so once again, the internal oblique, the action is lateral flexion, right? So if you bend down to the side to pick up a suitcase next to you, that would be your internal and external obliques. Okay. Finally, if you peel off the rectus abdominis and the internal oblique, you see this muscle, so the deepest muscle of this group. Um, this is called the transverse us abdominis, right? U-S-I-S, very important to know the spelling. Um, so transverse abdominis. Um, origin is back here on the lumbar. Insertion is up here on, um, you know, essentially the fascia, the connective tissue aponeurosis, even of um, the ventral, uh, the ventral side. And so when insertion is pulled towards origin, um, essentially you suck your gut in, right? So if you are trying to pull your gut in to tighten a tight pair of pants, you are going to contract your transversus abdominis. Right. If you are increasing the pressure of your abdominal cavity during childbirth, you are contracting this transversus abdominis and like all the other muscles as well. Okay. So again, transversus abdominis is going to increase the pressure of the abdominal cavity, decreasing the volume. Right. So you pull your belly button towards your spine. The obliques are responsible for lateral flexion. Okay. Another way to look at this, which is a little bit more um, reflective of what we see in the lab, um, superficial layer is external oblique, the deeper layer is internal oblique, deepest layer is transversus abdominis, and the rectus abdominis is in the same layer as the internal oblique. Okay. Next muscle is the QL, quadratus lumborum. Origin is on the hips, okay, and the insertion right? Quad implies four. And so there are actually four insertions on the transverse process. So a um, little bit that's sticking out right here, transverse process of L1, 2, 3, and, or sorry, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, so those are the origins, or sorry, the insertions and rib number 12. And so these are the all, all the more movable parts when this insertion contracts towards the origin, the entire spine, again, lateral flexes. Um, also, this is used to depress the ribs, so to pull on the bottom rib, um, and of course, all the ribs are connected together with, um, with fascia, with muscle, and so pulling on the bottom one is essentially pulling all the other ones down as well. Okay, so that is the QL. Um, another set of muscles is the multifidus muscles, uh, multifidus for singular, multifidi for plural. Um, and so this is a set of muscles that actually um, attaches to multiple vertebrae all the way up your spine. Okay, so uh, specifically it originates on the sacrum and transverse process of every single uh, vertebra, right? So the sacrum down here, um, and the transverse processes. Um, and they insert on the spinous process, so these here, of a superior vertebra. So essentially, these are, um, you know, if, if these are your vertebrae, um, my thumb side is the front, right, the anterior side, the back side over here is the, um, the spinous processes, so the posterior side. When these muscles contract, they are going to pull the spinous process down. And so what that does is it essentially alleviates pressure on the intervertebral discs. And by pulling in this direction, it lifts the pressure of vertebra on vertebra um, and with that disc in between. Okay? So essentially these muscles are really great at stabilizing the spine. Um, they make sure that um, all of the processes are aligned in just the right way. So they're not like off kilter and uh, maybe rubbing on you know, uh, some of the cartilage in a really damaging way. Um, also, again, they alleviate some of the pressure on, um, on those intervertebral discs. Um, and so these are the ones, um, and actually a lot of these muscles that we've been talking about are what you build when you build your core. Um, so like any kind of balance exercise, any kind of um, 
you know, you know, yoga or, uh, you know, those, you know, large exercise balls, um, that is building these stabilizer muscles, the multifidy, the erector spinning, the QL, um, even your abdominal muscles on the anterior side. Um, and so collectively, these are going to increase the health of your spine. A um, couple more muscles with which you should be familiar. Um, these muscles are in the thoracic region, so only um, in the region with the ribs. Okay, remember that there are 12 ribs, 12 thoracic vertebrae. So it's the only region with, um, with the ribs. Um, each thoracic vertebra articulates with a pair of ribs. Okay, and of course we have the sternum and costal cartilages on the ventral side. And so um, the function of essentially your rib cage um, is to protect the heart, it's to protect the lungs. Okay, um, also to change volumes, which enables breathing, right? Like if you can't move your rib cage, it is nearly impossible to breathe, right? You're going to need assistance with breathing if your rib cage cannot move, okay? So by changing the position of your ribs, we change the volume and therefore we can inhale and exhale, okay? Um, the other muscle that's important in breathing is your diaphragm. And so that is, um, you know, yet another torso muscle and it's attached to the inside of your rib cage. When it contracts, it actually shortens down, right? So your whole diaphragm, you know, it's kind of domed when it's relaxed and then it gets pulled down to expand the volume of your uh, thoracic cavity. And then when it relaxes, it domes back up again, again, shrinking the volume of your thoracic cavity. Okay, so here we can see, um, you know, a relaxed dome, a relaxed diaphragm. When it contracts, it contracts down and back and forth and back and forth for breathing. Okay, so absolutely critical to breathing. Um, in the thoracic region, these muscles are actually located between the ribs. Okay, um, so instead of all the different somites, all the different segments fusing together to make this really big blanket typed muscle, each of these muscles stays in its lane. It stays in its own segment. Okay, um, we are not going to look at all of them, although they're listed out here. We will look at the external intercostals, the internal intercostals, and also to an extent, the diaphragm. Okay. The intercostals are another pair of antagonist muscles. Again, they are located between the ribs, so both of them have attachment sites on a pair of ribs. I note that the external intercostals are a little bit more lateral and posterior. The internal intercostals are more anterior, and they're going to be deeper. Okay? Also note that the direction of the fibers is opposite. Right? External goes down towards the midline, internal intercostals go up towards the midline. Okay, again, just like with the obliques, they're kind of pulling on these bones um, in two different ways, strengthening the movement, right? Or in this case, um, producing opposite movements. Okay, so the external intercostals, their origin is on the top of a rib. Okay, so that's the, or sorry, the origin is on the inferior border of the rib, right? So, um, and, uh, <laughs> Uh, they insert on the superior border of the rib. And so when this lower rib uh, is pulled, it's going to be pulled up closer to the top rib. Um, and so essentially this elevates the ribs. Right? So the entire rib cage can hinge up, expanding out, and therefore increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity to produce an inhale. Right? So here, the inhale um, is produced by the external intercostals, right? I kind of want it to be backwards, right? I would want external to be an exhale, but it is exactly opposite from that. Okay. As an antagonist, the internal intercostals um, have opposite origins and insertions. So here, when the insertion is pulled towards the origin, the upper rib is pulled down towards the lower rib. And of course, this is happening in every single rib. And so collectively, when these muscles contract, the entire rib cage, which was inflated, is pulled down. Okay, so the ribs are depressed, decreasing the volume of the thoracic cavity and facilitating an exhale out of the lungs. Okay? Specifically, these muscles are for a forceful exhale. So not just like the nice calm breathing that you're doing right now, 
but instead um, a forceful exhale. So you are forcing air out of your lungs when you're talking, when you're singing, when you're playing the tuba. Okay, so internal and external intercostals both are in between the ribs. The external intercostals are for inhaling, internal intercostals are for exhaling, okay? um, and they are in a slightly different um, place of the rib cage. Okay. The diaphragm, okay, this contracts inferiorly. Again, uh, it is attached to the inside of your rib cage. Okay. When it contracts, it pulls down, again, expanding the volume uh, of your thoracic cavity. Okay. So that is all for this lesson. Stay tuned for the next one.